Chapter 13, Part 2 of The Nightland by William Hope Hodgson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Nightland. Chapter 13 Homeward by the Shore, Part 2. Now, in the beginning of the fourth hour, as I did go with the maid, I to see afar off one of the half bird monsters that I did see before upon this place where there did be naught save great stones and boulders for a great way that did be many miles. And truly I to hide very swift with the maid, where two great boulders did come together. And surely the bird creature to go past at no great way, and to go with a great bounding, that did be half of flight and half of leaping, as that it did be too weighty in the body to make to fly proper. And indeed, I do have a sudden memory how that there did be a picture in some book that I did read in the mighty pyramid, where it did show such a bird thing as this. And to make remark in the book that these things have been seen no more in the nightland for a score thousand of years or more, and to be extinct as we do say. But indeed, now I do think that they did be come downward to that warm country a great while gone and so to have new life and to breathe through a great age, and this way to have set a pattern unto the humans. And in verity it might be that in some age that did be far after that time, the humans to find some way to journey from the pyramid, and to build a new refuge in that deep country, and mayhap the humans this wise to have a new space of life, after that all the nightland did be dead and lost in the bitter frost of eternity but this, indeed, to be no more than an odd thought. For how might any great multitude pass the monsters? And I to ask that you take it for nothing of fact, but only as of my suppositions, and this wise to come back again to happenings. Now when the bird thing did be gone a long way off, I to go forward again with mine own, and to have a new care, and to look very swift and frequent every way and truly it did be as that the creatures did inhabit that part of the country. For in an hour after that I to see a good score, and I to free the discos from my hip, and to have it ready in mine arms, beside the maid, and so to journey. And many times I to have to hide with mine own, and to crouch low among the rocks and the boulders, and this way to escape free of all for a great while. Yet when that the fifth hour did be nigh gone, I heard a noise sudden to my back, as we did go over a clear space, and in verity there did be one of the monsters that came upward over certain rocks that were to my rearward, and surely it to have been stayed hid there, or resting, and to have heard us, or to have smelled us, but anywise then to have knowledge of us, and to come with low and brutish heavy boundings very lumbersome after us and I looked every way in a moment, but there was nowhere any shelter anigh. And the maid to leap sudden from mine arms, that I be free with the discos, and I to look swift to her, and to see that she have her knife ready in her hand, that she might chance to aid me. But surely I might not fight in ease of mind, if that mine own did be needless in danger. And I caught her very quick by the waist, and set her upon the ground between my feet, and she to make half to refuse, but I to have no time for explaining, and to be sharp that I have her safe, so that I gave her a little shake that did sudden to make her feel the strength in me, and she then to be instant quiet in my hands, and to let me that I set her upon her face, and to cast the thick cloak above her, and in a moment to be stood over her, and to set down the visor of mine headgear, lest that the bird-monster strike me in the face. And surely the bird-thing did be scarce an hundred good paces off, and to make two lumbering and monstrous bounds, and to come at me. Yet truly it made sudden a pause, because that the discos did roar and send out fire as I made it to spin. But in an instant the great thing to come in at me upon the left side, and to strike me very hard with the bill, that did be so long as mine arm, and had surely gone through my body, if that I had been naked. And the bill of the monster rang upon mine armor, and it smote me twice this wise, so that I staggered very sick and shaken. But in a moment, as it made to draw off, that it should come the more hard upon me, I swung the discos very sure and quick, and I smote the bird thing above the place where the great seeming leathern wing did join upon the right side, 
as it should be the shoulder of the bird monster, and in verity the monster gave out a mighty squarking, and went backward this way and that, and beat all about upon the stones, and did strike with the great bill at the place where it did be hurt. And I heeded that I end it swiftly, and I ran in upon it, and the creature to strike at me with the great bill very savage. But I jumped speedy to this side and again to that, and so in a moment to have chance to come in surely. And truly I split the skull of the bird-thing, so that it died very quick and was gone from pain. And the bird-creature lay all spread upon the stones and the rock of that place, and surely it did be as that it were leathern, and made somewise as a bat doth be of this age, in that it did have no feathers. And truly it looked mighty where it did be spread and indeed the body to be full so big as the body of a young horse, and the bill to be very deadly and sharp and cumbrous as you to have guessed, and I to be all and utter thankful that it did be there dead in the stead of mine own body, and the thing yet to twitch and stir a little as the life did go from it. And surely I was back then very speedy to the maid, and she to be kneeled upward to watch me and I took her into mine arms and looked well about, and made then forward again. And about the middle part of the sixth hour of crossing that rocky land, I saw that we did draw near unto the shallow river that you shall mind I came over after that I had done with the old and flying ship. And in all that time, since the bird monster to come after us, I had seen but two more, and they were a great way off so that I guessed that I was come beyond that part where they did go very frequent. And I to wade over the river, and to carry mine own upon one arm, the while that I did sound my way with the staff of the discos. And truly I came across very easy, save that I did have to go around somewhat, where that the river did seem to have a deep place. And when that we had crossed the river, it did be full one and twenty hours since that we slumbered, as you shall know, if that you but count a little. For you do mind that we spent a certain time within the tree, as I have told, and this not to have been proper counted into the time of our journeying. And surely the maid to have been very quiet, since that I did show my strength a little to her, when that I made her to lie that she be safe from the bill of the bird-monster but she not to be any wise in anger upon me, but only, as I do think, that the woman in her did be something fresh waked unto me, and she to be very content that she be quiet in mine arms. Now the place that we were come to was much spread with boulders, but yet to have the beginnings again of the forests, as you to remember. For I to have made some small remark of the land in this part upon mine outward way and we looked about for a fire-hole that I should dry my lower garments, and truly we had not passed many in a great while, but we to be in fortune that we came soon upon a little fire-hill that did be no more than so high as a man, and have the rock all hot about, so that this did be a good place to our purpose. And I kissed the maid and set her down out of mine arms. And when that I had looked well about, and seen that there did be naught to our sight to give us to fear, the maid to help me with mine armour, and afterward with my garments, and to ease me always that she could think of with helpfulness. And she set the garments of my lower parts to dry, and whilst that they did be drying, she to make ready the water and the tablets, and to have me sit beside her in my body-vest and gear and we to eat and drink very comfortable in the warm hollow that was something anigh to the small fire-hill. Now truly I did be very hungry that time, and indeed to be always so, for the tablets did be very unfilling to the belly, as you do well know from my tellings. And when that I did be finished, I saw that the maid looked at me somewise odd ways, and sudden she to come into laughter and asked me whether that I did be very empty and in the same moment there to be a wondrous dear look within her eyes, so that I perceived that there went a mother-note under her impudence. And she to yearn, as I could know, that she have some way to feed me, but truly there did be no way, for we thought not to make to slay aught for our purpose, and we did be feared that we eat any root or plant, lest that we be ill. 
and this to seem strange to my spirit of this our age, but to be natural unto that. So that I do think I did be so long bred from the primal obtaining of food, that I did be all lost to that which should seem natural unto the peoples of this early age of the world, though we truly to think that the world doth even now be old, and this to have seemed a true thing unto every age that ever did live. Now, beside that we did lack somewise to think serious, that we slay something to eat, in that the tablets did actually suffice to our strength, I to believe that there did be some other reason that I do forget, and mayhap never to have thought plain upon, but which to be set within me as an instinct, as we do say. And this to mean if that I try to set it in other words, that the tablets did keep the body and the spirit in such condition that the forces of evil did have the less power to act upon us. Yet I have no remembering that I was taught in the preparation that I eat naught save the tablets, and this mayhap never to have been set upon me, but to have been as a thing that doth never need to have been told, even as you shall not tell a grown man in this age that he shall refrain from dung and eat only wholesome matter. And truly I to hope that I have made this thing somewise clear unto you, for indeed it doth be something hard to set out, for every age hath the subtleties peculiar to that age, and these to be hard to the understanding of other ages, but yet to seem plain and utter natural even without thought unto the peoples of the age. And surely all this to be plain to you, and to be over-plain. For in verity I tell to you and over-tell, until that I should be weary, and mayhap you to be the more so. And indeed I not to blame you, but only to hope that your understanding, which doth mean also in general your hearts, doth be with me all along my way, and indeed this my tale to be not easy told. And in verity I to be back now unto the maid a laugh upon me, and in the same moment deeply loving and a lack that she could not feed me, and I to laugh with her, and to have understanding with her, as you to know. And indeed I to have an heart that doth be made some ways natural unto understanding, so that even though I be dead when you read this, my tale, you to feel that we be friends, and you to know that, could I meet with you in pitiful trouble, I to have understanding and love to you, if that you be not utter brutish. And even so, I to be sorrowful that you should be brutish, and to have understanding, in that, I to know that by development you to become wise unto sweetness and charity, and in love with all dear things, and kind pity of the rest and this wise you to be in human sympathy with me, because that you do feel that I be honest with you, and somewise even now to your elbow as you read. And this to be writ now, and you mayhap not to be born a great while yet, but in the end to read, and to have understanding with me, and to know how I did love mine own. And so we to go forward again the closer, in that we do be the more knit in dear human sympathy and surely the maid kissed me very nice on the lips, and did promise again how that she should make me a great meal when that we did come to our mighty home. And indeed, as she to say, she to join with me, and we both to be naughty gluttons for that once. And surely I laughed gently at the maid, because that she should be so dainty a glutton. But for my part I to feel that I could eat an horse, as we do say in this age. And by that we had eat and drunk, and talked a while, and looked oft about, so that we know that no brutish thing came near to our hurt, the maid to tell me that my garments did be dry, and she then to give me aid that I dress very quick. And afterward she to help me with mine armor, the which she did wipe after that we had eat and drunk, and she to have had joy that she do this thing, and all things for me, and to have used a part of her torn garments to this end and so truly I to be clothed and armed very speedy, and to feel eased and the more sure in my mind. For in verity I was alway in unease, when that I did not be ready that I be able to meet any horrid brute that should be like to come upon us. Now when that I did be into mine armour again, the maid to set the scrip and the pouch upon me, and all the while I scarce to be loosed of the discos as ever. 
and we then to our way, which did be that we find a place proper to our slumber. And when that we did be gone always, and no cave proper to our sight, we found a great tree that did be set off alone, and had a plenty of branches, but none that did be near to the bottom part. And surely I gave the maid a lift, and held her up so far as mine arms did go, so that she might stand upon the palms of my hands, and be steady against the trunk of the tree, and she this wise to have a hold upon a branch, and so to go upward. And truly, when that she was safe, I loosed one of the straps from the pouch and the scrip, and I cast this up to the maid, and she set it strong about the branch. And when I had caught the downward end, I went upward very easy, and afterward took loose the strap, and this way we did be something safe, as you shall see. And we climbed upward then, and so came to a part of the tree where the branches did be very thick together, and we made here a place for our slumber, and the maid set the cloak over the branches that did be so close, and afterward we lay down. But first I set the strap about her waist, and thence to a branch, and she to refuse sleep until that I be likewise, so that we did be both very safe from any fall. And she kissed me, and we then to our slumber, and very weary, for it did be two and twenty hours by this since that we had sleep. Now we had eight hours in which we slept utter, and we both to awake as it did seem in the same moment but truly I to think that mine own did be wakeful before that time, for indeed, as she put her arms very dainty about my neck that she kissed me, I did have a quick and sudden knowledge that I had been kissed oft in my sleep, and this to have been but a little while gone, and surely it did seem to me that mine own did have a sweet and contented mischief inward of her eyes, but yet she to be very sedate outward, and to kiss me loving and dear, and then we to our breakfast upon the cloak. And afterward I climbed to the topmost branches of the tree, and looked well over the country all about, but there was no brutish thing to my sight in any place, neither near nor far. And I came down then to the maid, and told her how that there was quietness of life all about, and we had our gear together, and went downward to the earth, and I to help mine own, and this way she to be safe. Now, as we went forward upon our journeying, I perceived that the maid had a wayward air, and truly I thought that she did have her heart all set toward naughtiness and mischief. And in the same moment that I was in this belief, I did know in mine understanding that this did spring from the workings of my nature upon the nature of mine own maiden. And Nanny to walk in the first beside me, and to have no word for me, because that she did be so filled with the stirrings of her naughtiness that did be in the same moment very sweet unto me, and yet to waken all that did be masterful within me. And she to be that she did know, and to delight in her secret heart, that she wakened that which did be masterful in me, but yet in the same moment to be strong determined that she be not mastered by me. And surely this to seem contrariwise in the words, but to be clear to the heart, if indeed you have ever been loved by a dear maid of an high spirit. And above all this, the maid did be filled with a love for me, that did beat and dance in all her being. And this in truth to overweigh all, but yet from this same thing her dainty naughtiness to be born, because, as I did say, my manhood to stir all her nature upwise in sweet trouble, that did be half of rebellion, and half that she did ache that she be close unto me in mine arms. And in verity, you to be with me in all these things, if that you have had the love days beside a dear and dainty maid, of an high and pure and natural spirit, so that if you be old these days, even but the light merriment of a passing maiden to bring a pain of wonderings and golden memories upon your heart. And presently I saw that mine own put a little space between us, as the naughtiness did work in her, as my heart to know, and she to be offward from me a little, and she still to have no speech with me, but in a little to begin that she sing in a low voice, and have her pretty body very upright and lithesome, and to go forward with a wondrous dainty swing, so that my heart told me that she did all be stirred with small thrillings of defiance unto me, and with thrillings of love. 
and she to have the triumph of her maidenhood and of her womanhood, as it were both to contend in her and to thrill upon her tongue, and to show out the lilting and pretty warfare of her spirit that did go dancing and dearly naughty in her breast. And surely I went, very lifted in my heart and astir, for it did be wondrous to me that this lovely maid did be so utter mine. And to see but the way that she set her feet to the earth, and the way that she did lift them sure and dainty, and the way that her body did be poised, and the way of her head, and the way of her naughtiness, and the sweetness, and the love that did be wrapped in withal, did make me want that I have her in mine arms. But yet I not to do this, because that in the same time that she did so stir me to love and admirings, she to set somewhat else in me at variance, so that I did have to feel stern with her, for I perceived that she had that naughtiness then within her, that she did be like to have a real intent of impertinence unto me, so that she should be naughtily outrageous, and to have no heed to my advisings, neither unto my desires unless that I set my hand upon her to make her to obey. And truly you that have had dear maids shall follow mine explainings, but unto others I know not whether they shall understand, until they too have been possessed of one that shall set all their heart adrift, even as this one that did be mine own. And sudden I to know that Nani did change from her low singing unto an olden air, that had surely not been heard in all that eternity. And in verity, for a little while, I not to know why that it did so shake all my heart, nor what it did be, nor whether that I had truly heard it before, or only to think so. And surely it did be as that the silence of the olden moonlit world did steal all about me, and sudden I to know that the maid did sing an olden love-song of the olden world and to go halting a little as she sang, because that the words did steal something oddwise through the far veils of her memory, even as a song doth come backward out of dreams. And I to feel all my blood to seem to tremble in my veins, and my throat to be troubled, as with vague sobs that did be the ghosts of forgotten tears, and the dim sorrow that had come so swift and strange upon me, to be likewise steeped in golden mists of the love that I once did love, and the glamour to become all fresh upon me, and I to know in that moment how much we do forget, even when that we do believe that we have all memory and all sorrow within our hearts. And I looked unto the maid something dimly, because of the way that I did be, and I perceived in a moment that mine own did weep as she walked but the less with pain than with the strange anguish of memory, that doth have in it tenderness and sorrow and love and all that hath been and all that did never be, and all to make a veil unto the spirit, where doth be both a dim grayness and a warm and everlasting light, and an utter speechlessness, and the low and far music of forgotten songs, that do come downward over the shadowy mountains that do be builded of years and forgetfulness, and yet made to be seen with the light of that our memory which doth cast so many hushed shadows. And surely, as I did say, the maid did weep as she went, but not to be cast down, but rather that she held her head upwise, so that she did walk in a glory, and the song to come oft broke, and oddly, and to set her voice to little human quiverings, as her memory did shake her sweet spirit unto tears afresh, and she to walk with her pretty head upheld, as that she did go in a triumph, and the tears to come down strangely upon her face, and all her soul to be there, pure and wondrous, and in the same time both troubled and glad. And this thing to be very dear and amazing, and she to be as that she not to know then that she sang, but as that she did be lost in her thoughts, as we do say, and this to have come sudden upon her, out of all her upliftedness of spirit, that have been like to make her very open unto all subtle and subtle powers of thought and inward stirrings, as you shall think. And again the song to come full remembered and fresh, as that this eternity be but the yesterday of that moment and mine own to be all in a sweet madness with those half-dreamed memories, 
and the wonder and pain of all that no man hath ever said, and that shall be never said. And of the utter lost years, and all that hath been lost, and all forgotten greatness and splendor, and the dreadfulness of parting, and the loveliness of beautiful things that do be hid in the abyss of the years. And it did be sudden to my quickened fancy that there did be low echoes all about us, of the voices of dear beautiful ones that have died, for so did memory set a strange and lovely mystery about my spirit in that moment, that I did be all shaken so much as mine own. And I to be as that I drew my breath anigh to tears, and did be there with Nani amid the quiet spareness of the trees and the rock of that part of the land. But yet did be to see half dimly that I stood within a light, even as the light that doth be the wonder of olden sunsets, and I to be in the same time both that man and this man that now doth write, and to have beside my spirit but one maid, that I did lack to know whether I say to her Nani or Murdath, for though the two that have been mine own did be different seeming to the eye, there to be but the spirit of one maid beside me in that moment. And surely I did be there all shaken unto the seeing of visions as it did seem, so that the land about me to have grown half as that it did lack that it be real unto my sight, because that I looked inward unto lands that did be of memory and lo, in a moment this to go, and I to be in the country of the seas, and to look newly unto Nani, and she to go as I have told, and there to be the lonesome trees and the rocks in all parts for a great way about. And sudden, as I looked at mine own, she to come round unto me, and she held out her arms, and did gaze at me with such a love as that she were transfigured, and to need strangely that she be in mine arms, and surely I to an holy need that I have her unto me, because that, after all, there did be no wonder so great as that wonder, that when all did be said I did have mine own, after that all eternity had nigh passed. And in verity we ran each to the other, and did be silent, because that there was no speech of words by which we could say aught of all that did be in our hearts, and truly you to be with me in understanding, for you too may hap to have suffered this wise of dumbness, even if that it hath not been so great, but yet to make you to know. And presently we grew quiet in the spirit, and mine own to come back again to her joyousness, and to go beside me as we made forward. And presently Nani to begin that she look at me with dear impudences again, that did be very sweet unto me, but yet to be like to lead unto defyings and truly by these things shall you know the spirit of mine own maid, and there to be none to me that ever did be like her. But indeed you to think that wise of the maid that you did love, and all the world to be thinking each these thoughts of one dear maiden that doth be the one maid in all the round world. And this to be the lovely niceness of the human heart, and I not to have grumble thereat, but yet surely you shall say that this maid that did be mine own did be very dear and lovely. And in verity I to show my human heart in this thing, for you likewise to want that I think your maid to have been just so dear, and the more so. And indeed we ever to be going these ways, and to have good comradeship of understanding, because that we have all loved and suffered joy, and had utter belief in a dear one and surely a defyingness to come presently into the way that the maid did go, and she to walk a little offward from me. And truly I looked at her, both with love, and yet with somewhat that did be to reprove her gently, and all in the same moment that she to make my heart stirred with her sweet naughtiness. And she to look sudden at me, and to be that she have to intend to run to kiss me, but also that she be minded in the same moment that she set herself up impertinently against me. And in verity she made me to harden my nature a little, as manhood doth make a man to do, and this because of the rebellion that I knew to be in her, and she likewise to know. But she hid her eyes, when that I shook my head, half with play and half with earnest, and was then impudent unto me, and gone from that in a moment to her pretty singing, and her naughty walking apart. 
but she no more to sing an olden love-song. Now in a while we passed a basin of rock in a place among the trees, and there was a warm spring bubbling in the rock and the basin to be full of water, very warm and with some smelling of chemistry. And the maid told me that she would wash, and I to think it a good place for that end. And when I had tasted the water, I found that it did seem smooth and proper for our intent, as that there did be a verity of an alkali in it. And truly we washed, and after that I was done, the maid bid me that I turn my back, and I to do this, and she to mock me very naughty, whilst that I could not see her, and to seem very quiet. For indeed I heard no splashings of water, though I stood off from her a long while, and she alway to say naughty things unto me, as that she did mind truly to have me angered. For indeed she did have a plain intent that she mock at me, and to ease not her wit. And surely, after that I had stood a great while, I asked the maid when that she did be like to be done, but she to say that she was nowise ended of her toilets. And I knew very sudden that she made foolishness upon me also in this matter, and I turned upon her, and lo, she did be sitting upon a little rock, very sedate, even as when she had bid me turn from her, and to have made no more forward, but only to have been there at ease that she keep me turned away to please her naughty mood, and all the while have a double liberty to have impudence upon me. And in verity I did be a little angered, but scarce that I did know it, for I did love her very great, and was stirred inwardly with her dearness, and that she did look just that wise that I knew not whether I need to kiss her or to shake her, and truly how should I know? For my heart did ache that I have her to mine arms, but my brain to say that she did go over far in the joke, and truly you to see that I did not be unreasonable, neither to be lacking of grace, for indeed I do think that I was swayed always, because that I saw all the dear way that her pretty nature did work, and to conceive of her mood, and to understand and be stirred, but yet to shape a little in my manhood unto hardening, and in my judgment unto sternness. Yet truly I scolded mine own with no more than a little jesting, and to be nice and gentle with her, because that she did be so dear, and I to know just wise her mood and the cause and working of it. And I told her that I did love her, and that she hastened now and led us again to the journey. But indeed she only to make a face at me, so that I did be near like to shake her unto sedateness, and she then to be both merry and a rogue as we do say, and to stop her ears and again to sing very gleeful, and all so that she might not hear aught that I said. And surely she looked a very dainty, rebellious one. And I went then straight away to her, and took her hands from her ears, and I kissed her pretty ears very gentle, that I not to deafen her. And I kissed her lips as she did sing, and afterward shook her, that she be not such a sweet torment. But this to have no success that way, for she only to put her toes out to be kissed, for her footgear was off from her feet. And, indeed, I laughed, even as I made to frown, and truly I kissed her pretty toes, and tried then to coax her to go forward something speedy with her hair, and to be ready to the journey. But she only to sing, and to refuse to be sedate. And in verity in the end I caught her up in mine arms and had her bundle in my hand, and so went off with her very sudden, with her hair all loose upon me in a lovely and soft shining, and her feet bare as they did be. And this action I made, because that I was grown truly a little stern with mine own, for indeed she did have to need that she be whipped unto properness, as you shall think, that have seen how she did be this wise only because that her nature did be stirred strangely, and her womanhood and her maidenhood to be all unto war, and in part to make a rebellion against me, that she did no glad to be her true master, but yet she to be thus, even though she did be so glad. And this to act so, that she did be in the same moment both sweet and wise, and yet to show a dainty foolishness and a true naughtiness, that did make me to feel somewhat of a real anger, but yet did have me to know that all my being did be stirred by her so that I did think with one thought that she did be very foolish, and with another that she did be lovely wayward. 
Now when that I took the maid up so quick and made off with her, she to give a little gasp and to submit to me with a quick humbleness. But immediately she to regain her courage and to be outraged of me. But indeed I took no heed, only that I was like to shake her, and did know also that her hair did be wondrous pretty upon mine armour. And she soon to lie very quiet and easy in mine arms, and to be demure and I to have half knowledge of somewhat amiss, but yet to have no sureness, neither to think much upon this vague feeling. And when that I had gone a good mile, she to put up her lips to be kissed, and I to kiss her very loving, for she was so dear. And she then to say, very ordinary-like, that I should do wisely now if that I went back for her footgear, which truly I had lacked thought to notice, when that I picked up the maid and I saw that she had known this thing all that while, and had made that mile of carrying all a waste and a foolishness, because of the naughty rebellion which did be in her. And lo, I set her instant to the ground, and she gave out a little cry as she saw that I did be gone somewise hard and stern with her. And indeed I pulled a small branch from a tree that did be near, to be for a switch as you shall whip a boy with and I held her with my left hand, and in verity I laid the switch thrice very sharp across her pretty shoulders, that she know all that she did need to know. And she seeming to be ceased in a moment from her perverseness, and did nestle very quick unto me that had whipped her, and did need that she be wondrous nigh unto me. And truly, how shall even a young man flog such an one? And the maid to be very hushed against mine armour, and to resist that I look into her face that did be pressed so anigh me. But presently I used a little and gentle force, and so to look into her face something sudden. And truly that one did be smiling very naughty and dainty to herself, so that I perceived that I had not truly whipped her enough, but yet I could harden my heart no more at that time. For in verity there doth be a strange half-pain in the bosom if that you have to flog a maid that doth be utter thine, and thus to the despite that there hath been, as then, no properness of anger to have for an after self-reproach. And surely I to have done this thing only of a stern intent and steadfastness, that I steady mine own maid unto wisdom. But yet to have been helped by a little anger, because of the thing that she had done, yet alway my love did be so strong that mine anger never to have aught of bitterness, as you shall have seen, and to understand. And we went back then for the footgear of the maid, and she to be very hushed in mine arms, but yet, as I perceived, not to be quiet of an humble little heart, but only of the chance that her nature did be stirred that way for the while. And truly, when we were gone back, the footgear did be there to the side of the pool, and the maid gat shod very speedy, and would have no aid, and afterward did up her hair very tight upon her head, to have it utter from my sight. And this to be for a perverseness, for she knew that I did love to see it pretty upon her shoulders, or if that she must do it, that she do it up very loose and nice, and truly you to know how I mean, only that I have no skill of such matters but yet a good taste to admirings if that the thing be a right. And I to say nothing as I looked at her, and she presently to make a quick glance unto me to see why I did say naught. And I shook my head, smiling at her waywardness, but she to look away from me and to seem to be set to fresh naughtiness. End of chapter 13, part 2《Chapter Thirteen, Part Three of the Nightland by William Hope Hodgson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Nightland, Chapter Thirteen, Homeward by the Shore, Part Three. Now we went forward then upon our journey, and alway the maid to walk onward from me, but yet to have no other impudence, neither to sing, and I to go kindly with her but yet to think that she did lack somewhat to know that I did be truly her master, 
and I to wonder a little whether she did know proper that my gentleness with her did be not of weakness, but born of understanding and love, and the more proof that I did be fit to possess and to guide her. And truly this was the thought of a young man, yet lacking not of reason in the bottom part, though may hap to be something clumsy-seeming unto the mind of a maid, and to be very human to my ears, and you to have been likewise, if that you have tried always with a dear one, and she to be yet over-wilful, so that you to wonder whether she did truly know how you did understand. And surely a maid doth know much that doth be in the heart of a man, if that she be true woman in her own secret heart. And oft she doth know more of her man than her man doth wot of himself, and to go her own diverse ways that she search out and bring forth and waken all that is in the inward being of the man that she doth love. Yet when that she have stirred you in the deeps that you scarce to know, she to be all fearful, and in the same moment to have no fear, and to be in rebellion, and in the same moment to be most strange humble, and all to be born of love and nature in action upon nature. And more than this, how shall I have learning of the heart to tell you? For in verity there doth be much in these few lines, if that you know to read. And surely you to know or to learn, but if neither, then have you gone short of joy and the true inwardness of life. Now this way I did be, as I have told, and the maid to be quietly naughty in perverseness, as also I have set out. Yet to have a strict mind to her duties, and to go now wondrous sedate upon the journey, yet alway apart. And likewise, when that the sixth hour did come, and we to our halt as ever, she to be very speedy, and nice that the water and the tablets be ready for me, but yet to have no word, neither to eat by me, but again a little apart, and not to share the water, but to make a brewing to herself, when that I had done. And likewise the maid held not up her tablets to be kissed, as alway, but eat them, quiet and meditative, and with little nibblings, as that she did ponder upon other matters, or mayhap, to be not hungry. And these things I saw as we eat and drank in a silence, and I to look at the maid, somewise sad in the heart, and something stirred, and I to say to myself wisely, yet as a young man, that she did not yet be taught sufficient that I was her master, and this you to perceive and she never to seem to look at me, but to be quiet and demure, and to have her eyelid something down upon her eyes. Now presently, as I thought upon the matter, I saw that I do well that I take no heed of mine own, but to let her to come to a natural end of this naughtiness, that did be, in the same time, both pretty and a little foolish, so that in half I condemned it, and in half I was stirred, and alway I loved the maid very dear, and had a good understanding, and there to be also an interest in my heart at this new side that she did be showing. And also she to stir me odd wiles unto masterfulness, and so you to know pretty well how it did be with me in the matter. Now surely I found this plan, that I attend not to the maid, to have something of success, for I knew presently that she did look upward at me slyly from under her pretty eyelashes, and after to be demure in a moment, and this to go forward for a while, yet I to show no heed. And in a while I saw that she gave attention to her garments in the way of nattiness, and afterward she took down her hair, and made it up then very loose and pretty upon her head, so that she did be very lovely, and to tempt mine eyes that they look all the way at her. But, indeed, I did make as that I had no heed that the maid did shape her hair different upon her head. And she very soon then to speak, and to have the lesser gear together, and to make that she attract me. But truly I was very nice with her, yet to keep her now a little off from me in the spirit, and so to teach her that wise that she was somewhat of a dear naughty maid. But also, as I do think, I was this way, because that in part I would tease her, in great love of her prettiness and her makings up to me, and so maybe even that I make her to be the more defying of me. And this to be that I also lacked somewhat of reason, 
for I did strangely that I think that she need to be whipped, and in the same time, that I go to make her the more deserving of the same. Yet this to be the truth as I know it, and surely to be the natural waywardness of love. But yet there did be also in the backward part of my wisdom an intent that I be wise and careful with mine own, and I surely to have no full realizings that I did be like to set her further unto perverseness than yet she did be. Now after that I had shown well that I lacked to heed the maid, I found that I did be looking oft at her, and she to be so dear and pretty, and to be all hushed, that truly I could not bear that I be longer silent to her advancements. And I ceased then from pretending, and would have had her into mine arms, but she to be now in sweet dignity, and to keep me off with very sober graces. And because of this, I to feel some way that I did be some way in blame, and surely, now that I consider it, I can see that I was something acted upon, even as had been the maid, and so we two to be, and a most human pair, as you to say. And somewhat both alack, but indeed we did be very wholesome, and in utter love each of the other and mayhap both then to perceive something of the sweet foolishness within us that did be as yeast a work in us. For I thought that Nani did smile a little to herself. But surely this clear seeing to be but for an odd time, and afterward we each again to earnestness in our way with the other. But alway, even when we did make to show indifference, we to be something troubled inwardly with sweet flashings of our bewildered natures. Now, though I have shown you that I to know that I did not be utter free of this most strange and natural foolishness, yet you to perceive that I tell this only that I have utter truth of all things that did happen. For in verity, because that I was something subtly touched this way at whiles, yet was this no full excusing of the maid, though in the same moment you to perceive that there did be only the half of me to think that she did need to be excused for, in truth, mine understanding went alway in the main with the workings of her nature, and had a natural sympathy with her dear whimsies, but always, as you to know, I to be stirred constant in my manhood by her naughty defyings, and to be troubled in my natural sense when that her whimsies made her to act that she be likely to come unto aught of harm. And surely, now you to see all the way of my heart, and to have understanding in things that do follow and alway you shall mind that I did love her utter, and to crave alway that I be a shield unto her. Though truly there doth be, mayhap, somewhat in me that doth act to make me a little stern-seeming in my love, but yet not oft so, as you do know, that have gone with me in all my tellings. Now we went then upon our journey, and the maid to be somewhat before me, and offered to the side upon my right, and to have no speech with me, but to make a good pace, and to be very dear and graceful as she went. And now we did pass this thing of strangeness, and now that, and this I did point out to her, and made some telling concerning the same, having the memory of mine outward way, and how that I did see these things then, when that I was all in suffering of so lonesome a doubt. And she to hark alway very intent, and to move her head nice and intelligent, and to show that she heard me. And once I saw that she looked sudden at me with a dear light in her eyes, but this to be done in a moment, and she to be again silent-seeming and in her new perversity of dignity. And surely she did seem so utter sweet in this new way of naughtiness, but yet I did think, odd whiles, that I should like to shake her into dear humbleness and her usual way and in the twelfth hour we made halt again and had our food and our drink, and the maid to serve me very clever and quiet, as that I did be her lord and she an hushed slave. And I saw that she made a constant and naughty mock upon me, and truly, as I did half think, she to need that she be in care, that I not treat her sternly, as shall a slave-master, and to give her that which she did ask for so mute and impudent but alway she did stir me mightily to have her to mine arms and to love her very dear. And presently we did be again to our way, 
and to be yet silent, so that I scarce knew whether to have patience with mine own, or whether that I take her and speak seriously with her to cease this play, which did begin a little to dispirit me somewhat strangely. And in the end I went over to her, as we did walk, and I put mine arm about her, and she to yield to me without word, and to hark very quiet to my speech of reasoning and gentle sayings, and to hide whether she did be stirred inwardly or not, though indeed my spirit to know that her spirit did never be afar off from mine in all deep matters. But only this thing to be to the top, and to set somewhat between us that did be both a sweetness and a trouble. And alway, as I talked with the maid, I saw that she did make naughtily to act as that I did be a slave-master, and she but a chattel to me, for she to be hushed before me, and neither to yield her slender body willing to mine arm, nor to resist me. But only to be still, as that she had no saying in this matter, and as that I was like to beat her at my pleasure, or to withhold my hand, all as might chance to be my desire. And this, I perceive, was the shaping of her actions, so that all her dumbness and her quiet obedience did be but a way to say this thing to me, and all to have come from her love of me, and that she did be shaken in her nature by my manhood, and so to be but a new form of her naughtiness, that did have this change when that I whipped her. And all this you to perceive that have gone with me. And I saw that she would not cease from this perverseness, but made a dumb and naughty and hidden mock upon me, very dainty and constant, and scarce to be truly perceived save by the inward sense. And truly I grew something angered afresh, and to feel that she did need that she be shaken so stern that she come unto the reality that I did be her man and natural master, yet alway in love. And surely I loosed her then and went off a pace to her side, and we again to go forward this wise, yet she soon to have a greater distance between us, which she made very quiet and natural, but indeed I saw what she did. Now about the fourteenth hour of that journeying I saw before us in the far distance the rock upon which did be the olden flying ship that you shall remember. And presently, as we came more nigh, I looked off to mine own, and saw that she did be staring that way, and to be in wonder, yet to say naught to me. And soon, as we came very close, I did want that I tell her about the ship, and of mine adventuring there, and of the wonder of that olden ship set there through eternity. But in the first I hesitated, as you shall think, because of her way, but truly my heart knew that her heart did be proper unto me, and moreover I should be small in my nature if that I let any pettiness put a silence upon me though, in verity, if that the maid had not been inwardly loving to me, I had been that I had told her no word, and this to be very natural, whether it be of smallness or not. And when that we were come beside the great uprising rock, I made halt, and the maid to halt with me, and I showed her how that the thing upon the rock did be an olden flying ship from the mighty pyramid. And in the first she asked no questions, but did be quiet, and but to show with little noddings that she did be greatly interest. And I to show to her how this olden ship did be there mayhap an hundred thousand years, and to have been there, as it did seem to us, that were of that age, since the beginnings of the world, though in verity our two spirits did know that the beginnings of that age did be truly the ending of this, as you also to know and much I told mine own, and afterward concerning the two humped men that did come after me, and she alway to be silent, until that I spoke of the fight, but then to come round upon me very swift and with a dear light in her eyes, and had asked, before she did what, whether they did hurt me. And surely this to have been the first thing of her old and sweet naturalness that she did say for a great while and I to be so in delight that I had her into mine arms and kissed her very loving all in a moment, and she to submit with a nice gladness and to nestle unto me, and all unwitting that she did be gone from her waywardness. Yet in verity she did be a naughty maid, for she minded in an instant 
that she did forget her pose unto me, and lo, her lips did be no more to search unto mine, but to be as that they did be kissed only of my will, and she to have no more live nestling unto me, but only to be quiet in mine arms. And I looked into her face, and her lids to be down somewhat over her pretty eyes, and she did look very hushed and demure, so that truly I knew not whether to shake her or again to kiss her. But in the end I loosed her, and made her then that we go forward. Yet, indeed, she did rather stay a while, to hark further concerning the olden ship and of mine adventurings, but she did then to mind that she obey as a slave shall obey, and truly I did punish her, in that I told her no more, but went forward at a good pace, and had some natural wonder how that I deal with such a maid if that I spare to shake her. And surely I thought then again that I leave her be, and so to have her presently again to her old and natural way. Now in a while I lifted the maid into mine arms, that I carry her as ever, through the last part of each journey, and so to have her never overtired for the morrow, and she for a moment to resist, but instantly to give unto me, and to lie quiet in mine arms, as that she had no saying in aught that did be done, but must alway obey and indeed you to see how dearly perverse she did be. And I went on then through four hours from that time, and looked oft upon every side, and walked quietly, for truly we were come now into a part of the country where I did feel that there might be near some of the humped men. And I saw nowhere anything to put me in dread. And alway, as we journeyed, there did seem a great stillness in all the country near about, and afar off the low mutter of the great fire-hills in this place and that, and a drowse as of life and warmth about us, and everywhere the air very rich and plentiful. And presently, when that we did be come down from that high place where did be set the rock and the olden ship, we came in among the trees that came very nigh to the shore for a great way, and oft as we did go, there were clumpings of small fire-hills that did cast fire and noise, and oft the roaring of monstrous springs aboil, and then again the smell of the woods about us, and oft still in odd places the low near sound of a little fire-hill that did burn lonesome in some clear space of the woods in this place and that. And afterward, we to be gone onward again into the dull low mutter that did be in all the air of that country, and that did be but a seeming of silence, because that it did be so far and constant. Now about the eighteenth hour I to note that the noise of the great fire-hills grew more loud, and I saw presently over the trees, afar upward in the great night and gloom that did lie above, those two mighty fire-hills that I did feel to make the earth tremble in that part upon mine outward way. And surely I have told something of this before, and you to remember, if that you but think a little moment. Now it may appear strange that I speak this wise of seeing the two hills of fire, as that I had perceived them sudden. But indeed I have been long able to see them both, yet to have had no attention to them because that they did be a great way off, and because they did be but two hills of fire in a country that did be plentiful with such. And truly I not to have said aught about them, only that our path did take us now by their feet, and I to see them as it were newly, and to have nice ease of heart to perceive how that they did be a wonder unto the spirit and the brain for all time for it did be as that the earth had a constant shaking within miles of them, and that a monstrous force of nature did be in that place. But yet there to be no desolation around, as you should think, but in all parts a wondrous growing of trees and great plants in abundance. And the trees to grow upward upon the shoulders of the mountain, and there to be no falling of hot rocks and ash, as you to think, but all very sweet and wholesome as that the mighty valley made a chimney to the mountain, and mayhap to others, so that their waste, if that they had such, did go free. But indeed you shall take no heed of this explaining, save as an odd thinking that hath come to me, and to be without foundation, 
and there to be no surety of the reason to this, only that there did be no falling of ash in that part as I do know. Yet in other parts of that country the fire-hills did make new mountains of the matter that did come from them, but this not to be always so, and there to seem to my knowledge no cause to order why this did not be constant, save that my guessings to be right or not to be blown from some. But, indeed, I to be sure only of that which did be plain to mine eyes, and mayhap there to be no mystery in the thing but a score of natural explainings, if that I did know or had patience to think long enough upon such. Now when that the eighteenth hour did be proper come, we to be anigh to the great hills, and there to seem nowise any danger of falling fire, so that I sought about for a place for our slumber and I found a cave in the side of a big rock, and the cave was dry and comfortable, and had the mouth about a score feet above the earth. And when that I had climbed and looked well into the cave, I gave the maid an help, and had her safe into that place, and she then to prepare the tablets and the water, the while that I brought up a boulder from below, to set very light balanced in the mouth of the cave. And this I meant for a signal to fall, if that any creature should climb upward into the cave while that we did sleep. And surely you to know this plan, for I did it before, as you to have learned. And the maid sat near to me, and eat her tablets very quiet, and with a demure naughtiness, but yet to be also in wonder, and to gaze outward at the great fire-hills, and to be in awe, as I did know. And I put my half-anger and my play from me and told her of mine outward journeying, and how I did go by these same mighty fire-hills that did seem as mighty torches to light me in my search, and to have held a new strangeness and wonder over my path. And she still to be silent, but yet to look at me twice or thrice with a very dear and loving way, though she did hide her eyes in a moment when that she saw that I perceived her. And soon the maid spread the cloak for our sleep, and while that she did this, I looked well about for any creature that might be an eye, and I had an especial thought unto the humped men, but indeed there was naught living unto my sight, and nowhere did I see anything to put me in fear for our lives. And truly I had a great viewing from that place, for we did be in an upward rock that stood in a high part, and gave the cave to be twenty good feet aloft, as I have told, so that all made to set us in a lofty place and the cave to look toward the two mountains that did rise upward no more than twelve good miles off from us, as I do think, and the country between to be somewise as a mighty park, for it was spread much about the feet of the great fire-hills, and did be bare in this place and that, as that rock did make the earth naked there, or the falling of some later fire to have wrought thus. And between the bare parts there went strange and romantic woods, seen mistily, and in parts the gleaming of waters, as that hot lakes did be half shown among the broken forests. And presently the land did go upward with a monstrous sweep, and was then in great terraces in the height, and the trees to grow very plentiful upon the mountains in sundry parts, and so those two mighty hills to go upward to meet the everlasting night. And presently to show strange uplands that did be seen very wondrous and queer in the light that did glow from the vast glowing of the fire that did be a crown upon the hills, that did seem in verity to be that they burned halfway between that known world and the lost olden world, that was mayhap two hundred great miles above in the everlasting night and eternity of darkness. And I looked upward for a while, and was much held by the mighty uplands that did be on high, yet did lie utter far below the burning crests of the mountains, and showed vague and sombre and dreadful seeming, because that they did be so lost upward, and to have the mystery of the red shining and of the shadows upon them, and to seem to slope far under the great fires, but yet to be a place where no life should ever come, because that they did be so monstrous away upward beyond the great shoulders of the hills, the which did be themselves a huge way up. And truly I should give you somewhat of the affecting of those grim and unknown uplands, if that I said they did seem to my fancy to be a place where a sorrowful thing might wander lost for ever. But why to think this thing, how shall I say? 
and do tell it to you only because that it doth seem to hold in the thought the grimness and utter desolation of those high and lonesome lands. And by this thing I was done looking, and turned me about, and so did find that mine own did stand silent, and waited that I come to my slumber. And surely I looked at her, but she did have her lids something downward, when that she saw me turn, and so in the end I said naught, but went to my sleep, and had the discos very handy as ever beside me. And I then to know that my nine did lie down beside me to my back as alway, and this to gladden me as you shall think. For I perceived afresh how thin did be the crust of her naughtiness, and I to be alway stirred and touched in the heart by her loving naturalness, that did need alway that she be near to me, save when she did play this naughtiness upon me along the way. And I saw that she had no mind to be perverse whilst that I did slumber, but must now be nigh unto me, and quietly loving, though no wise truly ceased from her naughty acting that I'd be as an hard slave-master, because that I had whipped her, yet she to have somewhat a truce with me, as my heart did know. But indeed she not to kiss me good night upon the mouth in her dear usual and sober fashion. And surely I did lie a while, and pondered upon the maid and upon all her ways, and I perceived that she kissed me not, only because that she did not be able to break utter from her perverseness, that did come from the stirring of her nature. And truly I did love her, and was half-minded that I turn about to her, and take her a moment into mine arms, but yet to abide from this, because that I was set that I wait a while, and to bring her to me this wise, mayhaps. And presently I knew that the maid kissed mine armor very quiet and shy, because that she must kiss me, yet to be intent that I have no knowledge of this pretty act. But indeed I did know in all my being, and did be newly tender unto her, yet to say naught and to wait. And thus I knew presently that her breathing did go easy, so that I perceived that she was all content and gone over unto slumber, somewise as a little child that doth be weary, and doth sleep without care and with happy assurance. And in verity did a man ever to have so sweet and gentle a maid, that did be in the same time so troublous and perverse. And I to lie yet a while, and to note the constant tremble and shake of the rock that did be under us, and this to be alway thus as I did lie, and to be the more plain, because that I did be quiet in thought. And this, as I conceived, did come from the earth-shaking that was made by the inward fire of the world, the which did make a vague trouble in all that part of the land. And then, in a little, I was gone over into sleep and waked not for seven good hours. And then to hear the fizzing of the water, very brisk and cheerful, and so to have mine eyes open in a moment, and to know by my timekeeper or dial, that was somewhat like to a watch of this age, that I had slumbered through seven good hours. And this to be learned after that I looked to see whether mine own did be well, and whether that the boulder did balance in the mouth part of the cave. And surely there did be nothing in harm for the boulder was there, as I did put it, and the maid a little off from me, and did make ready the water and the tablets that we eat before our journeying. And I rose then, and in the same moment I did know that my mouth had been kissed whilst that I slept, and the knowing to come to me vague, as that I had been kissed in my dreams. And I looked over toward the maid, but she to have her lids something down upon her eyes, and to seem very demure so that I saw her naughtiness was come again upon her. Yet truly I could not bear that I not to have her into mine arms, for indeed her perverseness did seem as that she did the more tempt me unto her. And thus I came to her in a moment, but she neither to resist me nor to give herself unto me, but only to be still in mine arms, and to do no more than submit very quiet. And because of this I loosed her unkissed, and was silent, and a little to be angered, even whilst that my heart perceived the way of the working of her heart. Yet truly I ached now that she came back to her dear natural fashion. And I eat my tablets and drank some of the water, and the maid to do likewise. And afterward I looked well from the mouth of the cave, 
but did nowhere see aught to put me in trouble for our safety, though truly, as presently I saw, there went an herd of strange creatures afar off in the northwestern part, which did be that way of the country beyond the feet of the mountains toward the inland. Now when that I was something assured of the safeness of our way, I got the discos to my hip and the maid to have the scrip and the pouch ready to my back, and her bundle to her hand, and so all to be ready. And I went downward from the cave, when that I was girt, and gave aid to mine own, and so to be soon upon the journey. And surely, as we went onward, and I to look about me with different seeking eyes, from my looking on mine outward way, I to see how wondrous this part of the land did be, and how that it did be truly like a great and wondrous park, that did be made of the skill and labour of godlike things, and truly this to show my feeling as I looked always. And all that part did be bred of the inward forces of the world, and did be burned clear in this place and upheaved in that, and made to an hot lake in another part, and odd whiles there to go a great steam fountain that did whistle a lonely song for ever and anon there to be a small wood, and again a wood, and oft the quietness of great and strange trees that did stand alone. And here and in that part a little fire-hill, that did be surely no greater than an house, and we to pass seven of these in but three hours. And two to glow very steadfast, and to make no vigour of burning. But the five others did burn very strong, and sent out a smoke and ash, and made a small desolation all about them. And of these five there did be one that cast stones oft and again, so that they went upward with a strange loud noise, and fell in this place and that, all about, so that we came downward more nigh to the shore, that we be a good way off. And here, as I do mind, there was a strangeness, in that there did be many trees that had stones set in the branches and this to be plainly the work of the little fire-hill, and I to think it but something new come, else surely there had been no trees within all that space that it did throw. But yet, mayhap, I am wrong in this, for all things did seem that they grew very easy in that country, and indeed this to be for surprise to me, only that I saw it with mine own eyes, as we do say. And alway, as we did go, there were signs of inward life and forces, so that we but to stand quiet to feel that the earth did tremble gently in many parts. And presently there sounded for a great while a low and dull booming sound, and this we found to be from a place amid certain great rocks toward the mountains, for there came thence a mighty upspouting of boiling water that went so high as an hundred feet, and off to be thrice so high and belch a great steam and there went up in the jet of the water a great rock, that was so big as an house, and did dance and play in the might of the water, as that it had been no more than a thing very light and easy. And when that the water fell, as it did oft, the rock to go downward with the dull booming that we did hear. And I minded how that I had heard the booming upon mine outward way, but had been then something more to the shore so that it had been less plain to mine ears as you shall suppose, neither had it been then to my sight, as now it did be to us, because that we were come mayhap the half of a mile more toward the inland of the country. And truly we looked a while at this huge great fountain and up-boiling, and came nearer unto it, but yet to be a large space off, because of the way that it did throw out a spattering of small stones odd whiles and surely the thing did cough and roar in the deep earth, and anon to gruntle gently and to sob and gurgle, and lo, to come forth in a moment with a bellow very hollow and strange, and the great rock to go spinning upward, and all a-shine in the light from the volcanoes, and was so round as a monstrous ball, and polished by the fret of the waters, so that I saw it had surely danced in the great jet through a weary time and anon the jet to cease and to go downward with a great soughing and thundering of waters, and the dancing rock to fall downward from that height which did show very huge, now that we did become so near, and the rock surely to fall backward into some deep pit, whence came the waters, and as it fell there was again the dull booming. But why the rock brake not I could not perceive, 
save that it had always fallen into a boiling up of waters and had no hurt from the rock of the place whence it was come. And the maid and I both to have stood a while, that we stare at this thing, for it did be more strange than I have made you to know, but now I did make to our journey again, and did think the maid followed. But lo, in a moment, when that I looked, she was to my back, and went toward the great boiling fountain. Then I stopped very swift and called to her, but she did take no heed of me, and went onward very naughty, unto the danger of the great boil of the jet, and the constant flying out of the stones that you do know. Now even as I stood and looked, the maid drew nigh to the place where the water did thunder, and the jet in that moment to bellow, so that I knew it came upward again. And I ran then after the maid and she to see me, and began likewise to run from me toward the monstrous fountain, and surely I did think that I had done well if that I had whipped her or beat her proper before this time. For truly it did be as that her naughtiness had gone nigh unto somewhat that did be near to a wayward madness, so that as I did perceive all her nature did surely work in her toward some deed that should be for regret and this to come, because that she did be something pushed from her dear balance by her loving, and by the act of my manhood upon her, so that her nature both to be in rebellion against me, and to need me, and all in the same time. And this way she to be in an inward turmoil, and to be ready foolishly that she put in danger her beloved life, if only thereby she to make me something adrift, and in the same moment to have some ease of her perverseness and in verity you to know all this, because that I have shown the working of her heart to you before this time. Now I caught the maid among the great rocks, which did stand all about, and before her there did be a monstrous pit whence came the upbursting of the water, and the water to go upward before our faces in a mighty column, so that it did be as that a sea shot up on end, into a pillar of living water, and went upward for ever, as it did seem in that moment and how we should be saved I knew not, for the water did be as that it overhung us, and should come down upon us and smother us in one moment for ever. And the roar was in our ears, and shook all the air of that place with sound, as of an harsh and dreadful thunder, and there was a scalding of beaten water, as fine as an haze, all about us. And I had the maid in one instant into mine arms, and I ran very swift, with a fierce running, that I have her away speedy, and so made forlorn trial that I save her life. And lo, as I went from under that huge and dreadful overhang of the great waters, there came downward from the height a great stone that had been cast by the jet, and it burst upon the rock to my back, and a certain of the flinders did strike and ring upon mine armor, and made me to stagger as I ran. But I held the maid crowded safe against my breast, and she did not be hurt, and truly I was yet able to run, and did save mine own, and brought her out from under that grim spouting. And I put the maid down then to her feet, and she not to know how near that she had given us to death, neither of the way that the fragments did strike me. For she laughed very naughty and gleeful, and truly I laughed not, for my heart had been nigh hushed with terror for her so that I did be yet sick in my spirit, and mayhap also something shaken by the blows that I got from the broken stone. And, in verity, I to have meant that I flog her very sharp, if that there be no other way that I might bring her to reason. For, in surety, as you to see, she to be acting so wild as a child, and so unreasoning as only a maid in love and I to know that she did have to be brought back from this way of spirit, even though I have to hurt her pretty body, that I bring her again to her dear, natural wiseness. Yet, indeed, I could not whip her then, because that she did laugh so joyous, though with a naughty heart, and did look so wondrous dainty, so that even her defyings did but seem that which my heart desired and you mayhap to have been something likewise in the love days. Yet I pled and reasoned with her to be a wise maid, but indeed she only to make a gleeful mock of all that I did say. End of chapter 13, part 3